Hi, I'm Mike Winninger, and I'm here to pose the question, is it time to stop college football? I asked who here is a fan of college football, who here is a parent? I love college football. I like turning on games on Saturday and watching them. I love my kids. By the way, I want to clarify. I'm not proposing that we cease college football. I propose merely that we consider stopping college football. By the way, a constabulary note, this topic will be presented in Significance Magazine, jointly published by the American Statistical Association and the Royal Statistical Society in December of this year. I'm really excited about it. This talk is based on my article that will appear in that magazine in two months. This talk is dedicated to the parents of Kenny Bowie. Why should we stop college football? My premise is that college football is a public health risk. A public health risk is something that is known to be injurious or to cause disease. It is mitigated by public policy. I'm going to propose a simple public policy change I would like you to consider it. You don't have to agree with me. I just want you to think about it. Here is some basic pretext. Firstly, a third of all college athletes play on a football team. Next, college football is vastly more injurious than all other sports combined. Why do I propose to stop college football games? Here's why. According to the NCAA's own published report, Injury rates in game time scenarios are seven times greater than in practice scenarios. Football is injurious. Football games are injurious. I propose we stop them. I was inspired to propose this idea because in part of my daily bread, I work as a statistician for clinical trials. It's work I'm very, very proud of. Clinical trials are considered the pinnacle of scientific evidence when we want to test efficacy of new medicines or new interventions. When you randomize somebody to accepting treatment A or treatment B, it's because you don't know which is better and you want to test that rigorously. The International Conference for Harmonization of Clinical Trials is the major organizing body who promotes the best practices in organizing clinical trials. Two rules in their guidebook I want to highlight. Firstly, the need for formal procedures to cover early stopping for safety. That's a Stop in matters of safety. Second rule, you want to stop the trial early if superiority is established. I'd like you to keep these two things in mind. Stop for safety, stop if there's superiority clearly established. Here is the one graph I'm going to show, but I'm going to show it multiple times. I mined a publicly available database for 10,000 college football game box scores, and I got the scoring profiles over the, over the course of every game for 10,000 games over 12 seasons. I can tell you at any point in the game what score differential you'll need between team one and team two in order to have a 95% likelihood of accurately predicting the game winner. I can tell you what score differential you'll need to have if you want to accurately predict the game winner to within 99% accuracy. Just follow these curves. That thick blue line, the lower blue line, is a 95% accuracy curve. If at any point on the horizontal axis, as time goes on, if the score differential goes above that blue line, the team that's in the lead at that time is 95% likely to win the game based on these 12 years worth of data. If at any time during the game the score differential exceeds that thin blue line up top, then the game winner is 99% likely to be the team that's in the lead at that time. So just as a, a simple example, 
at the end of the third quarter, if the game differential, the score differential is about eight, seven or eight points, the team that's in the lead is 95% likely to win. At the end of the third quarter, if the game differential, the score differential in the game is 17 points or so, then you are 99% likely to be the eventual game winner. Excuse me. That's it. Simple graph. Headline. I can tell you, if you are above a certain differential, I can tell you with a very, very high likelihood you're going to win the game. Here's an example of how we'd apply this graph. Let's pick Central College versus Luther College in 2010. A team scores with 7 minutes and 38 seconds to go in the first quarter. The game is 7-0. There's a 7-point differential. With 2 minutes to go in the first quarter, the game is tied. So there's a 0-point differential. The differential goes back to 0. Next score occur occurs with 13 minutes to go in the second quarter, and then they tie the game again. And then the game starts to get out of hand. Now. With nine seconds to go in the second quarter, the game is 28 to 14. We have crossed the 95% boundary. A ref could come in and say, we should take the players off the field. There's a 95% chance that the, the team that has 28 points is going to win the game. There's no reason to put the contest on any further. Let's end the game. I would like to stop and make a point. I do statistics for clinical trials. We set up a stopping boundary before we take patient number one. When we cross that boundary, a data monitoring committee meets and decides whether we need to stop the trial. Why? It is unethical to continue to subject patients to a randomization paradigm to treatment A versus treatment B when I have clear evidence that, that one of them is better than the other. I would like to re-emphasize that point. It is unethical to continue to subject patients to treatment A versus B when I know that one is clearly superior. If you don't like 95%, we can go further. They score again. They don't quite cross the boundary. Whoa, team comes back. That's OK. The, but as game time goes on, that differential becomes more and more potent. At some point in this game, the score differential crossed the 99% boundary, which means I had another opportunity to think critically about continuing the game. The game continued, of course. There was no such thing as a stopping rule. So the game continued. And the, uh, the winner at that time eventually went on to go win the game. Final score was 45 to 27. I'd like you to keep this game in mind, Central College versus Luther College. OK, so I ran a simulation. I set up the stopping rule, basically those two blue lines you saw. And I said, well, what would happen if I took all the games from last season, 2014? There's about uh, 970 games. And I said, what would happen if I simulated a stopping rule like the one that I proposed? How would that actually affect the season? Well, here's my results. I'll show you. Uh, just keep an eye on the right-hand column. That's the 99% stopping boundary. Let's, let's, let's pretend that we wanted to set up a 99% stopping boundary. We'd only stop the game if we were 99% certain we could predict a winner. Okay, firstly, 75% of the games were stopped. Three out of every four games played crossed the 99% boundary at some point in the game. The total number of minutes played was cut in half. I do not know. I don't think it's known, but certainly I don't know. I don't know if there's a uniform level of risk across the entire game time. That's an untestable assumption at this point. But presuming that there's a uniform level of risk for injury across the, the span of the game time, cutting minutes in half by this stopping rule reduces risk of injury by 50%. If I could reduce the risk of cancer by 50%, guess who'd have a Nobel Prize? <laughs> this is a simple idea that could reduce risk of catastrophic injury, or even non-catastrophic injury. I mean, who wants to break an ankle? Not catastrophic, but who wants to go through the misery of having to wear a boot for six to eight weeks? Every, um, every stopping rule 
has a, um, has a cost. Mine has a 1.4% 4, 4 prediction error rate. 1.4% of, of the games that were stopped eventually flip-flopped, and the, the, the team that was winning at the time of the stop went on to be superseded and overthrown. That fits. We chose a 99% boundary, so about 1% will have errors. You're probably objecting. Here's common objections. Well, we'll lose money. Americans, we love comebacks. You can't stop a game. It's unprecedented. Allow me. Firstly, the vast preponderance of money earned in the college football system is upfront due to ticket sales, TV contracts, parking, concessions, things that happened before the third quarter of the game. I assure you, there is vastly more money made before the stop would occur. Secondly, we love comebacks. Great. Tell me your favorite football movie. I like football movies just as much as the next person. Not a single football movie that I could find has a narrative arc where the comeback was over the course of a 60-minute game. It's all of the, the team that spent the whole season coming up from the bottom or about the player's lifetime. I've never seen a college, I'm not aware of a college football movie where the, the comeback occurs in the span of one game. There is precedent for stopping. To my knowledge, most stoppings occur out of a sense of sportsmanship, the mercy rule. In boxing, there's a TKL, so there is w at least one safety-based stopping rule. I would say football is unprecedentedly dangerous, so it's okay to break precedent. Question, who benefits from this? Chris Norton played for Luther College in 2010. Do you remember that slide? Chris was injured in the third quarter. He doesn't remember what time. I talked to him on the phone. It wasn't documented, but the game was out of hand. The game had already crossed, by the best recollection of Chris, of when he might have gotten injured, the game had well crossed the 95% boundary, and we believe it crossed the 99% boundary. Why was Chris on the field at that time? Why was anybody on that field? The game should have been stopped. Devin Walker, played for Tulane, signed a contract with the New Orleans Saints. Not because he's going to ever play football again, but because He's a hardworking individual who's emblematic of what the, the New Orleans Saints believe. Devin was, Walker was injured in the last play of the second half, well after the 95% boundary was crossed. Why was he on the field? Parents, this one is for you. I'm a parent. I, I would not want to ever read this in a, um, a news article. Adam Taliaferro was injured in the last play of the fourth quarter of a slaughter of Ohio State versus Penn State. They're playing today, by the way. 15 years ago, Adam Taliaferro laid on the field as Coach Paterno hovered over him, hoping that he would recover. The news article referred to this as garbage time. We know what that means. It's where you put your scrubs on the field to see what they can do. Why was anybody on the field when the score was 45 to nothing, or whatever the score was. Anybody whose kid gets paralyzed should never have to read garbage time. I know it's not the journalist's fault. It's a colloquialism. We all say it. Anyways, uh, <clears throat> here's my second to last slide. This uh, talk was dedicated to the parents of Kenny Bowie. Kenny Bowie won't ever get a chance to play college football. Kenny Bowie played high school football until two weeks ago. Played defensive back for Evergreen High School outside of Seattle. Kenny suffered a uh, traumatic brain injury on the field, sent to the hospital. He died as a result of his injuries. He won't ever get to play college football. The score in the game was 34-0. Kenny was injured in the fourth quarter. Why he was on the field, I have no idea. So. Uh, TED, is a, TED Talks are about ideas that could change the world or change lives. Uh, I hope you'll agree that this talk could 
could lead to a change of lives, I think in the case of Kenny Bowie, I think it could have saved a life. Thank you very much.